You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. You know, Ed, uh, injuries have struck my team. They have decimated it in a lot of different ways. I've had to make moves where I brought guys up from the minor leagues, and and, I, and I've also made a couple of uh, transactions just to be able to stay afloat and be a little bit above 500 in my fantasy baseball league. And yet I feel like the White Sox are already moving towards blaming injuries for everything here. Have you have you picked up that tone? Like in, in my fantasy baseball league, I lost Jacob DeGrom, Max Scherzer, and now Walker Bueller is, I mean, like my entire pitching staff is destroyed my top three starters. And I'm still five and four in it. Like I added Jake Berger on my fantasy team this week, backup. You know, at the third base position, maybe in the utility role, he's been killing it lately, but I've adjusted to things. And yet it feels like every time somebody makes the argument that the White Sox have not done well in the front office, have not done well uh, with managerial decisions or coaching decisions uh, or, or the players performing on the field, immediately the first thing that somebody throws back at me is, well, injuries. Injuries are a part of the game, right? Well, the, the, here's the ridiculous part about it, though, is... is that suggests that if Lance Lynn had started the season in the rotation and not been hurt, that they would be well above 500 at this point. No. That suggests that if Eloy Jimenez was in the lineup and healthy, that his presence alone would make up for the fact that Yasmani Grandal isn't hitting very well or that Josh Harrison and Larry Garcia can't hit in, at second base or... Uh, you know, that Yohan Moncada is underperforming. And I know Moncada was on the injury list. I, I, I understand that all these guys are there. But when you're talking about the front office and you're talking about making a, a World Series run, and you and I hit on this plenty going into the offseason and during the offseason, one of the hallmarks of a team that is ready to compete is when they have depth, when they have a guy that can step up. And that's been a problem for the White Sox is that injury bug hits them. But then what's coming up behind is either inadequate or, you know, it is not enough to make up for the fact that somebody on the field isn't performing. And really, the, the problem is, if you're going to sit there and blame injuries, you better be able to sit there and explain that there's a reason why nobody could step up in their place or why you have situations like Sunday where... Lucas Giolito is the ace of your staff and should be handling a, a really lousy Texas Rangers lineup and ends up going six and giving up four runs and putting them in a position where the bullpen better lock it down or else, and then the bullpen doesn't lock it down. Wait, wait, you mean you mean the guy that in the offseason when the, the lockout was going on kept talking about building value and his own value? And uh, when he gets the free agency, he wants that value to be really high because uh, Lucas Giolito... And you know what? I got nothing against you personally. I think you're a pretty good pitcher. I don't think you're an ace. I think you're showing that because when you have a 5 nothing lead, you can't do what he did in his last start. You you can't do that and then expect that you're just going to walk in and get one of these $300 million pitching deals. I'm sure you'll believe it, but I, if I were a GM, I'd be looking at things like that saying, no, nah, that's not the kind of guy that I could just put in there when my team needs to stop the bleeding. And there shouldn't have been that much bleeding over the last couple of series. Of course, this episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by Family Waterproofing Solutions, Boeing Walls, Window Wells, Foundation and Crack Repair. Some pump needs looking at whatever it is. Keep water away from your home and out of your basement, and you get money off when you mention Socks in the Basement. Family veteran owned and operated since they started in 2013. Give them a call 24-7 at 708-330-4466. See what a difference a family makes at FamilyDry.com. They should have won two out of three against the Dodgers. All right. Game one, they got. Thank God Dave Roberts never read the scouting report and sent in a left-handed relief pitcher in David Price up against Gavin Sheets when Tony would have just batted a guy who was on his way to triple A. But because that guy comes in, because Price comes in, he goes to A.J. Pollock because he's a slave to lefty-righty matchups. 
And Pollock probably should have been in there the entire game. Right away, Pollock gets the hit. They win game one of that series. Fine, you lose game two of that series. You should have won game three. Oh, That's yeah. a debacle. That's the one where La Russa is, is, is intentionally walking a player with a one-two count. And as many times as he can say, I take criticism, he clearly does not because everybody can present numbers to show that he's wrong and he still insists that he's right. So whatever. You should have gone two out of three in that. You went one out of three. You should have won all three games against Texas. You had the opportunity and the means to, to win all three games against Texas, you walked away with one of them. Worst case, your team should have gone four and two and could have gone five and one over those six games, and you went two and four. I, I, I don't care. I mean, I'm glad Lance, Lance Lynn is back. I'm glad he's back. Okay, and I, I know that Fangrass is saying that they still have like a, I want to say 47, 48% chance of making the playoffs because they're they're taking into account guys' tendencies and their trends and the fact that this might even out and their very easy strength of schedule. And I know that's a talking point on the broadcast because they don't want you to stop watching or listening. But when you have the last couple series like I just watched, I've, I've lost all faith at this point. Like I'm one of these guys that's like rattling the sabers like, Fire somebody, fire the manager, fire the hitting coach, you know, fire the, the strength and conditioning guy midseason, make some sort of a statement, trade somebody, do, do something, because this is just the definition of insanity. We're just beating our head against the wall and getting the same results. Well, yeah, and I, I misspoke. Giolito was what, Saturday? And then Sunday, you know, you, you had you, <laughs> injury strikes again. Okay, so there goes Michael Kopech, but then Johnny Cueto comes in and just absolutely saves that game. Yeah! And, and and we're sitting there, though, in extra innings, and I'm sitting around watching the game with a few people, and we're watching as, as they, you know, oh, an intentional walk to bring up Jose Abreu. Well, yeah, I guess they figure he's going to, oh, there he goes, rolls one over to shortstop. And then we're sitting there watching, it's like, well, of course they're going to walk Jake Berger, because look what's behind him. Uh, that, that's a manager I would like on my team. That's a manager that gets an impact off of his decisions, right? Like, when was the last time you saw Tony make a managerial move? where later you said, wow, that made a difference and a positive impact. I mean, just just over this weekend, I can't remember if it's the Saturday or the Sunday game because they all blur together in a big giant pile of of crap. But at some point, he decides that he's going to pinch hit for Adam Engel and he's going to bring in, I want to say, who did he bring in? Moncada, right? Right. So after he brings in Moncada, and I want to say this is the Sunday game, he brings in Moncada, who's terrible at the plate and has absolutely no chance how does a cold player now coming off the bench cold come out and all of a sudden break out of it in a pinch hit moment? I, I don't see how that ever happens. So that's a waste. And then what you do is you move Garcia in the right field, which makes your defense out there worse. And you bring in Harrison to go stand at second base. And then what happens? A couple of innings later, your team's making this miraculous comeback. And all you need is for Harrison to put his bat on the ball. And in that exact same spot, here comes Harrison, another terrible batter at the plate. And you never get anything. Now, I don't know if he never makes that move and angles up there, if angle gives a, a better result. But what I'm saying is that Tony's moves just never pan out. You know, I'm watching the Rangers manager. What is, what's his name? Woodward? Okay. Chris I'm, Woodward, yeah. I, I'm, I'm watching him make very informed, smart decisions that worked out for his team in big situations. And I'm watching another guy that still thinks that intentionally walking guy based upon what side of the plate he hits on when he's got two strikes on him is right days later. That's you know, It's impossible as a fan to wrap your head around that and then think this team's going into the postseason, let alone doing anything in the postseason. Well, and th- therein lies the problem, right? You're watching Chris Woodward sit there and, and just read the scouting report, all right? Yeah, he, he takes a risk that Jose Abreu is going to come up and get a big hit but there's already the guy on second base anyway. So why not play that percentage and say, let me take this guy who's been an RBI machine throughout his career off of the plate and put him on first base where he can't really hurt me that badly. Meantime, yeah, he's just looking up behind him. And, and you're right, the, the whole bringing in Yon Moncada for Adam Engel, the question is, is does Engel do better in that situation than Moncada for starters? And then secondly, you know, I was a little infuriated because I'm looking at what they have on the bench and I'm sitting there going, all right, I understand that Yasmani Grandal's status may be up in the air, but if you're going to take the the move of bringing up Sebi Zavala to make sure that you've got another catcher because Yaz is that unavailable, why not just go ahead and put your 33-year-old catcher on the IL, 
bring up another bat and just say, look, we're, you know what? It sucks. We're in a slump anyway, but we're going to give this guy a break and hope that he heals instead of trying to push him. Or instead of trying to go into a bunch of games where now we're short a bench player and having exactly what happened happen where all of a sudden you're stuck. I mean, you're stuck with Larry Garcia's in right field and Josh Harrison is playing and he's going to hit in that situation. And all you have to do is just look at, well, well, gee, what's Jake Berger going to do versus what's Josh Harrison going to do? And Berger came really close to tying the game at the end there. But even then, you know, we're looking at, as I'm sitting there, I'm watching, I'm like, why is, where's Liam Hendricks and why isn't he pitching instead of Matt Foster, who just got eaten up the day before? And, you know, what, are, what exactly are these moves? So, yeah, you're right. You can, you can watch, if you watch these games, watch as the other managers, even on teams that aren't that good, make moves that make sense, and then just ask yourself, are the White Sox even putting themselves in a position to win? Or is this just, like you said, a, 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 a team that we have to lose faith in now because guys are not going to return to their baseball cards and you don't have a manager who seems to be able to push the right buttons right now. Whether he can, un, you know, whether he can fix that or not, right now he's not doing anything to help the team. If you or someone that you love are starting to have a little bit of a hard time around the house, They want to keep their independence. They want to stay inside of their home. They don't move around so well. Hyatt Home Medical Equipment has everything to help out. We're talking CPAP machines, therapeutic chairs, hospital-type beds, conversions for the bathtub, railings, a chairlift for the stairs, a ramp outside of the house, and they work with your insurance. Think about this. You have somebody that depends on oxygen, but they don't live on a ground floor. Get an extra tank, insurance pays for it, and that way you're not constantly going back and forth up the stairs with the oxygen tank. You know they're taken care of. Whatever you need, Hyatt is there for you, and if you mention socks in the basement, you get a discount. 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. Check them out online, see everything they have to offer at hhme.com. Over this past weekend, our good friend Jake Berger, who's been on the program before, uh, got engaged. And I knew that because uh, the Sox in the Basement account also follows his girlfriend, now fiance, soon to be the wife of the White Sox third baseman designated hitter who has made a splash. He's been one of the, the best guys out there offensively all year long. He's been a bright spot. Ashlyn Carmella joins us on the show. How are you, Ashlyn? I am wonderful. How are you guys? Great. Congratulations on the engagement. How how does a baseball player propose? Is there is he smooth on the <laughs> transition? He doesn't bobble it or anything, does he? <laughs> no bobbles. He actually took me bowling, which is one of our favorite date nights to do before, right after the game. I mean, we literally left the field. He, sh- he showered, of course, and then we literally went bowling, and then we went um, on a nice walk down the river and. He popped the question. I think it was the most nervous as I have ever seen him. He was sweating bullets. <laughs> See that that's crazy to me because if you think about it, like you know, not to bring up a sore point, but like I want to say that last week, and it might even have been right around the nut, you know, right before he gets engaged, he might have it on his mind. He he made a play that didn't go very well for him over at third base, and a lot of guys let that get into their head. But he literally comes up like the next at bat and hits a bomb. Like, he could shake it off right away, so I'm surprised he gets nervous at any time in his life because he seems like he's a cool customer. Yeah, no, he is the most calm, collected human being I've ever known. It drives me absolutely crazy sometimes with how um, calm he tends to be. I don't know about much about the baseball thing, so I don't know. I think sometimes he likes if he has an air he wants to go, just hit a ball really hard like anyone would feel like if they were angry or frustrated at a mistake that he made. Um, But I think he was definitely nervous, and it was the first time I've seen him sweat in a long time. All right, so now you're you're in this world. I mean, you've already been kind of in it. You 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 know, you spent a lot of time down in AAA. How how long have the two of you guys been together? Um, I want to say maybe like almost a year. Okay, so almost a year. You've watched now. 
yeah. him him jump back and forth a little bit. I think he's sticking in in the in the majors right now. The way he's hitting, he's one of the the better hitters on the team. Uh, I think he gives a little bit of confidence to his manager that he can he can plug him in somewhere in the middle of the lineup and he's going to collect some hits. He looks really good. Heck, I just picked him up on my fantasy baseball team. Uh, I mean, he's obviously doing well. If he, if people are doing that, he, he's doing a very good job up here. But what has it been like for you? I mean, you're dating him. You go back and forth. To, you know, you've seen minor league ballparks and major league ballparks. Has it been a whirlwind? It is so much. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And baseball is all very, very, very new to me. I mean, I learned at the beginning of the season that you could steal a base. I had no clue what I was getting into. Um, I love this. So, I like, you're not, you're not like a baseball girl, right? Like, it isn't like you found no, him because you dug no. baseball. You you just liked him, and then he was like, by the way, I'm a baseball player? Yeah, I was like, oh, okay, cool, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I really have, like, no clue. I mean, I'm learning every day and the other family members of the other team members are like so great at being like, oh, you know, when you hit a ball and it fouls, it's a strike the first two times. So it's I'm learning day by day. So going up and down has been really fun. I think for me, I don't know how Jay feels about that, but for me, it's been fun to just see the, the difference, the level of play, what the majors feels like when you're in, like, I mean, going to Fenway was like, for me, who I don't know anything about baseball, was a magical moment where I understood the history of the game and was like, wow, this is pretty remarkable what you're doing. And then being down in AAA, you're just like, you're there and you're doing the same thing every day. Nothing changes in his routine. Nothing changes in ours. And you're just really grinding out. And it's, I mean, it's hard work all the time. What is it like with the the wives and girlfriends of the the other players? I mean, we've seen this in movies before. I've seen this depicted, but I don't know how true it is, where essentially like all the wives stick together. The girlfriends are almost like a separate group. You get married, you get promoted to the other group. Sometimes they, they, sometimes <laughs> they get along, sometimes they don't. I've seen it kind of portrayed in movies, but what is it really like? Uh, especially now you're up here with the club and you've gotten to meet those uh, that are the partners of uh, other players on the team. I think everyone's been great. Honestly, I don't, I haven't really felt that separation of uh, classes. Um, everyone's <laughs> been super, super, super warming. Um, I think the first wife I ever met was in spring training and it was um, Tim Anderson's wife and she was just amazing. And everyone I've met so far has been just like that. And I mean, you're always together all the time. Like you're essentially another family of, 26 and we all have kids or a lot of them have kids and you know we do our things together and we have bible study the guys have bible study so it's it's just another um added family and i I, we're lucky that we all kind of get along and there's really no drama at all and our guest today, like every guest on Socks in the Basement, brought to you by the Village of Lamont, want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green spaces filled with adventures. Visit the Village of Lamont, a great place for Jake and Ashlyn to take a day trip. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and look at their calendar on the website to see what they have going on each and every weekend. There's always so much in Lamont. Visit LamontDowntown.com. You know, uh, last season, we interacted a little bit through social media with uh, Ashley Rodan, uh, Carlos Rodan's wife, and she she gets really angry during uh, Carlos's game days. Like, she tweets when she thinks that he got a bad <laughs> call by the umpire. Do you get that passionate about it? Do you feel like, you know, you, you have to defend him because he's your guy? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't. I'm still learning the difference between of what a ball and a strike looks like. So I'm assuming if you ask me that question in like a year or two, I will probably have a different answer for you. Um, so for me, I'm like, eh, I'm just really learning, you know, <laughs> really learning as I go. But I am super passionate when Jake hits like a home run, that feeling. I mean, I was there the day that they went to the 12th inning and he hit that home the pinch it that won the game and I don't think I've ever screamed or cried as much as I did at the same time which is so much emotion um and excitement um but the bad call thing I don't know anything as much as I will I guess as I continue learning about the game um to be like that was the wrong call 
You know, uh, we've we've talked with uh, Jake before, and he's got that burger bombs uh, thing that he does, uh, all about mental health, and yeah. it, it seems like it's a really positive thing for him. Does he get really upset? Because I, I, when I play 16-inch softball, Ashlyn, and I have a bad day, I come home annoyed, and it doesn't even matter. You know, like I'm not a major league baseball player, so I would imagine he comes home every once in a while, and you're just kind of like, you know, you 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 have to kind of be the person that that deals with the emotion, right? Yeah, you have definitely. I, I mean, yesterday he's like, I think when he called me when he got into Detroit, he was like, man, I got robbed. <laughs> that win, that would have been a home run. Um, so by the time he gets home, a lot of it's dissipated. I think I know when he makes errors, it's it's frustrating for anyone who has a job that makes a mistake, right? And then when you have a job where people are consistently betting on your performance, the results of your job for that day, um, it's an added pressure. So when you make a mistake where you feel like you let your teammates down first and then Everybody else down second. It, it weighs on you, but he knows like the sun comes down and it's going to go back up tomorrow and there's going to be another game and there's going to be another day for me to do, do my job. So he's very balanced when it comes to that, but he definitely gets um, frustrated. <laughs> um, but he, he does well at not bringing it home because when he's home, it's like, okay, we've got three hours of awake time at this point until you got to get up and leave tomorrow at 8 a.m. So. Yeah, I would imagine it's a busy schedule and he's, he's carving out time. And I would imagine now with a, a wedding coming up at some point, uh, he's going to have to to pick out certain things and help in some way with yeah. the planning. And uh, when, <laughs> when are you thinking about doing this? Have you already discussed it? I know when I when I proposed to my wife years ago, it was like full speed ahead immediately. She already had like a vision as to yeah. what she wanted to do. Or is, yeah. is that what you're doing? Yeah, we talked about a wedding a long a while ago, well before he uh, asked me. So we're thinking next. No- I mean, with baseball season, we really got three weeks to kind of have a wedding. And during those three weeks, there's probably like twelve other guys that you've been friends with that also are getting married at that same three week time frame. So we're definitely going to do next November, um, November 2023, and we're probably I'm. I think we're really leaning towards this really pretty p- p- place um, right outside Knoxville, Tennessee. Wow. November is the time for weddings for Major League Baseball players. I never thought of that, but yes. that's incredible. It is like back to back to back to back. <laughs> You're just doing nonstop. Like you get married and then you have to go to somebody else's wedding like the next day, it sounds like. Yes. <laughs> it's crazy. Yes. And I think in this, this off season is Andrew Vaughn and his fiance and Kayla and Gavin Sheet. So it's like back to back to back to back weddings. Wow, a lot of White Sox weddings on the way. Well, very exciting. I, you know, yes. I got to be honest. It didn't. It has not started off well yet. It is not over yet for this team. I really hope that the window for weddings doesn't open more. I want it to stay in that three week window because that means they went into the postseason, right? No, I agree. Ashlyn, uh, first of all, welcome to the White Sox family. Congratulations on your Thank engagement. You. I, I look forward to you uh, learning a little bit more about the game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Maybe this time next year I'll be able to give you a little bit more insight. Yeah, we can bring you on as an analyst in the future once you figure out the balls and strikes. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. <laughs> Ashlyn Carmelo, the fiance of Jake Berger, say hi to Jake for us, okay? I will absolutely do that. At the official brewery of Socks in the Basement is Hailstorm Brewing Company, located in Tinley Park at 8060 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue. I'm actually stopping by there, if not by the very end of this week, over the weekend. I'm going to drop off some more Socks in the Basement swag, so if you stop in there, grab it at the bar. Highly acclaimed new brewer Will Turner is bringing decades of experience and excellence to Hailstorm Brewing tweaking their classic styles and innovating new beers of his own. That's a big tap room there, an outdoor patio that is beautiful, complete with a fire pit, and they have live music on the weekends along with trivia nights and other fun events. Do not miss out on their big summer beers that are out, including Primo Mexican Lager and the big beautiful wheat. And look for Morley celebrating Mokina, Orland, and Tinley Park. It is an American brown ale that's a little hoppier than the classic English brown ale. They have great beer, really good food, an amazing atmosphere. I love getting out there to Tinley Park. You should get there as well. Check out more on Facebook at Hailstorm Brewing Company or go to hailstormbrewing.com.
I thought it was interesting what uh, Jake Berger's fiance said about how much he thought he got that ball late on Sunday. He thought he had a home. I thought runner. he got that ball. Yeah, I thought he had a. I thought he had it too. And I was in that moment. I was like, oh my goodness, something's actually going to work out for them. But it did. And here's the other thing. I don't like to harp on just a series because I really like these these shows to be no. evergreen. But what is Sebi Zavala doing? Like, you know, I, I know that not everybody runs out everything. And it looks like it's going to be a ground out. But I don't know if you're sure at that moment that the ball isn't going to squirt through there. And you just got up from AAA on a gift because you're not even the best catching option this team has long term that's down in the minors. That's that's the young man by the name of Carlos Perez that everybody's been talking about is tearing it up down there, who some people thought should have been the guy that was brought up. So you should be hustling on everything. It just is a microcosm of this team. Actually, the biggest microcosm of this team is Luis Robert being out at third base when he didn't matter. My children screamed at the TV, Ed. My children, not just the 16-year-old or the 14-year-old, the 6-year-old yelled at the TV. Because even at the age of 6, he's been taught (laughs) enough about baseball to understand that Luis yeah. Robert didn't matter. And then the worst thing was listening to Scott Pazednik on the post game, uh, or maybe it was Guillen, whichever one was trying to excuse it, going, and and, and let's be honest, Pazednik's been great at like hold, holding guys to stuff in the post game. okay? So I, I actually oh, yeah, yeah. enjoyed his bluntness, okay? And I really have. The, the fact that he was like, well, here's a guy who's trying to make something happen. What are you making happen? There's two outs. The tying run is at the plate. You don't matter because you're down by two. The ball is on the side of the field that you're running from. So you're going second to third and the ball is in left field, which means it's not a guarantee. And even if you make something happen, like the outfielder panics over your blazing speed in this intense moment and launches the ball so high over third base that it hits Steve Stone in the forehead. You still, after scoring, have done nothing to change the outcome of the game because the guy at the plate still has to do something. You are a meaningless right. run. And that is that kind of stupidity uh, and, and Zavala not coming out of the batter's box hustling and just all these little things. They are a microcosm of this team. And at some point, you have to look at leadership and you look at leadership from the top down. You look at the manager, sure. Then you look at the general manager and you look at the people in the system that are training these guys on how to play. And then you look at you look at the people all the way up the line. You look at Rick Hahn, you look at Kenny Williams, who supposedly still works there. He's somewhere in the line. And then you look at the owner that put all these people in place, including the manager, and hired all these people and enables these people to all be in control of a Major League Baseball team this was supposed to be our window this is the smallest non-window i've ever seen if this is what we're going to be right because i don't know what what are we next year if we don't fix this now something needs to be done yeah and it's very easy just to sit there and say well okay so joe madden and joe girardi are out there on the streets themselves maybe maybe bringing in one of those guys a light a fire under this team and they'll start winning games but the fact is, is that you're still you know, you're still stuck with the same roster. I don't think they magically start hitting if all of a sudden you fire Tony La Russa. Like, I don't think you're getting 10 straight wins like the Phillies got, but I still think you got to do something, right? I mean, you're really just going to sit around and watch this all year long? And and trust me, I know La Russa's not getting fired because the billionaire up in the office there in the ivory tower is never going to allow us peons to feel like we were right. He heard the criticisms when he was hired. He heard the criticisms ever since he was hired. He hears the criticisms now. He doesn't care he really doesn't care. I mean, look at what look at what happened. I don't know if it happened for a fact, but isn't it curious that the media partner for the White Sox, NBC Sports, and the encore of the game in which Tony La Russa does that intentional walk that doesn't make any sense? Isn't it curious that they edited out that moment of the ball game for time constraints in the replay? And maybe I'm a guy in a tinfoil hat, but isn't that one of the more important moments of the game in the replay that people might want to rewatch? But, like, stuff was edited out. Okay? This is what you're dealing yeah. with with this team. All right? If you, if you haven't realized it, if you always thought that we were a couple of old men sitting at a bar screaming about something that we were making up in our own heads. You'd be right. Sometimes you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. 
Socks in the Basement. Socks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.